Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the stability-instability paradox. And the big question for today is, can nuclear weapons lead to more conflict? That might seem like a strange question to ask, so if you have any reservations, please hold off for just one moment. There's still a lot of debate in the international relations literature about what nuclear weapons actually do. And there are broadly two competing viewpoints here. The first one we've already seen, this is Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD. That viewpoint says that nuclear weapons increase the costs of war to intolerable levels. So I might be thinking about fighting a war against you, but you have a nuclear weapon, and I'm worried that if I start that war, you're going to respond by launching a nuke at me, which in turn deters me from starting the war in the first place. The alternative viewpoint is that nuclear weapons just change the stakes of conflict, and they do so in a way that actually makes the probability of conflict increase with nuclear weapons. And to see why that might be the case, let's look at an example. Here we have a strip of territory between A and B. So we have A's homeland on the left, and we have B's homeland on the right, and we have outlying regions in the middle. Now, both of these states are expansionist. They would both like to take over more territory. At the same time, though, they don't value all territory the same. They value their homelands much, much more than anything else. What that means is that A is not willing to risk the international condemnation for using a nuclear weapon to try to win over any outlying region or to try to take over B's homeland. The same is true for B. On the other hand, if it comes down to it, A is willing to endure that sort of condemnation to defend its own homeland from B. And again, the same thing is true for B, defending its own homeland. So imagine that's what's going on, and let's say that A and B fight a war over the outlying regions. And furthermore, let's say that neither one of these guys has any nuclear weapons right now, and in this conflict, B destroys A's military. So given that, B now needs to think about what sort of settlement it's going to impose on A. If there aren't any other strategic considerations that are important, and A's military is essentially defeated, what that's going to mean is that B is going to conquer everything. B is going to take over A's homeland. That is very bad for A. But let's think about an alternative world, one in which A has nuclear weapons. Let's still suppose that they're fighting a conflict in those outlying regions, and B wins that conflict pretty handily. B still needs to decide whether it's going to take over any sort of territory. Clearly, it's going to grab those outlying regions, but is it going to take over A's homeland? Well, probably not. It's probably going to limit its territorial take to just the outlying regions and leave A's homeland alone. And that's because A's homeland is so valuable to A that A is willing to endure that in, uh, international condemnation to launch nuclear weapons at B, which in turn deters B from going any further than those outlying regions trying to take over A's homeland. It's just not going to do that. It's going to leave the stakes of war like that. So what do nuclear weapons do in this example? Well, what we're seeing here is nuclear weapons limiting the amount an opponent can capture. It's because it is credible to defend the homeland with nukes, but not the outlying regions. Now, this is going to have two different effects on the cost-benefit analysis of war for both sides. First, this is going to increase A's expected share from war because nuclear weapons are essentially providing an insurance policy which says that if things go very poorly in the war with conventional military weapons, it's still not going to have its homeland lost. So this is increasing A's expected share from war and simultaneously decreasing B's share. But more important for our purposes, this is reducing the costs of war for both sides. It should be clear why that's the case for A. A is no longer worried about having its homeland being destroyed by B's invasion. But at the same time, B is no longer having to pay for that invasion of A's homeland. It's going to stop at the outlying regions. So we're seeing fewer costs of war for both sides. And we actually know a very important result from the bargaining model of war, which says that smaller costs of war lead to more fighting. Think about that. That's surprising, right? We're seeing nuclear weapons here reducing the costs of war, and then through this mechanism here, we're seeing smaller costs of war leading to more fighting. And this is what gives rise to what we call the stability-instability paradox. We see stability with states with nuclear weapons because they are not going to be engaging in high-stakes wars. That's because a side with nuclear weapons can credibly threaten to destroy the other side if it tries to take over all of its territory. So grab two states with nuclear weapons, neither one of them is going to be interested in a large war over everything. They're only going to be interested in fighting in these outlying regions. 
But the instability part of this is that states with nuclear weapons start low-stakes conflicts more frequently precisely because they are protected from these really bad outcomes. So we see both stability and instability with nuclear weapons. This is a very common result we see empirically when we start studying the probabilities of conflict actually going on in the world, and it's one reason to be pessimistic about nuclear weapons. And we're actually going to be looking at more reasons to be pessimistic about nuclear weapons in the next lecture. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.